Good morning. Buona sefiwe. It's wonderful to have you today joining us here at Calvary Chapel. As we continue with our desire to know God's word, to know him more, so we study his word week after week, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. And we find ourselves today in Acts 18. So if you have your Bible, please turn with me. Hold it there, and we'll pray together. Our gracious Lord, our everlasting King, Lord of all lords, we thank you for this wonderful privilege that we can come boldly before your throne of grace, that we can be found in you, Lord, fallen at the feet of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that your word is here with us. We ask that as we read through it, that your spirit will convict us and that would uh, live in a manner that is worthy of your cross. So help our hearts to grasp your truth today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Apparently what Josh just talked about, uh, you know, God being with us and not leaving us and you know, residing inside of us, giving us the assurance that we are never alone. That is the title of our, our teaching this morning. I am is with you. I am for Yahweh. He promised to be with us until the end of time. Let us read together if you have your Bibles. Acts 18. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testify to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, from now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice one of the worshipers, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians. Hearing, they believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid and speak and do not keep silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God amongst them. And when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews 
with one account, draws against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fella persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and of your own law, look it to yourself, for I do not want to judge, or I don't want to be a judge of such a matter. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at uh, Sincrea, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogues and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep these coming feasts in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at uh, Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Antioch was his home church. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Phrygia in, in that order, strengthening all the disciples. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John, that of repentance. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciple to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus Christ is, that Jesus is the Christ. Now today we are introduced to another set of people, that is Priscilla, Aquila, the couple, and also Apollos, um, who was very eloquent and he was well-versed. But first things, as we, we go back to, you know, this journey that Paul is still continuing in, he says that after these things, um, Paul departed from Athens, a place where they worshipped a lot of gods, a lot of um, idolatry going on in there. He went to another a city called Corinth. Corinth also is interesting. Corinth was also a commercial center with two harbors with it. Corinth, 
had also a reputation for loose living. <laughs> Imagine, that's, that's a reputation. Corinth had a reputation for loose living and especially for sexual immorality. And in classic Greek, they said, to act like a Corinthian meant to practice fornication. So if I say, you guys are... <laughs> it's funny, right? You act like Corinthians. They knew what it meant uh, those times. And also... If they would say, you know, I, I have seen or met a Corinthian companion, they meant I have met a prostitute. Or if they say, I saw you with a Corinthian companion, basically means I saw you with a prostitute. <laughs> that was their reputation of this uh, city. This sexual immorality was permitted under the widely popular worship of Aphrodite. This was the goddess of love, lust, pleasure, and procreation. And because this Greek man who, or generally the men who lived in this place, they were lovers of pleasure. They made options when it comes to how they're gonna live with the women around them. Minimally, they have three sets of women with them. The number one was the wife. This was a wife that is legally married to this man who whose job was to legitimately bear children for this man. The second category of the women for this man were the concubine. And those were specifically for sexual pleasure. And the third were the girlfriends. And these were only for social engagements. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> you know, the, nowadays we, we have names, you know, we have the main and not main, right? <laughs> the side cheek and whatever names they call. This was their culture, this is what they indulge in. This is, if you think, oh, this, you know, there's wickedness, there's evil right now. No, it has been for ages, it's been there. There's, there's nothing new. You guys are surprised, like, whoa, people, how can you do that? You, you have a wife, what about that woman? Now, these things have been there for ages. It's not a surprise uh, for us as we see it in the scripture. And so, uh, when, when the gospel came, these women who were mistreated, especially the wives, they were very attracted to Christian faith because it protected and taught faithfulness and commitment in marriage. So they were attracted to this kind of faith, that it is one man, one woman. No concubines, no girlfriends, no other people besides you. So you gotta be on guard. And this was very attracted to uh, these women. And this is a place that Paul gets himself into, Corinth. There were, we, we have gone through first and second Corinthians. You can refer to our teachings online or somewhere. Pastor Josh went through all of it. And he did find a man, Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. This was because of 
the rampant growth of Christianity. So the Romans were trying to kick not every Jew, but specifically those who believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and their King. So this man traveled. And so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. Basically, they worked with leather. You know, in the, these times, uh, when Paul lived, uh, they, they would teach people at a very young age to have, you know, a trade, something that you would do. Well, maybe you're, you're a teacher, you are a professor, you are a lawyer. Apart from that, they would teach you another trade. And they would call it, you know, a fallback trade so that whatever, if anything does happen with uh, this other career that you have, you would have something as a fallback. And Paul, as a teenager, uh, was taught to trade with leather. So he was a tent maker and he made other tent makers and they, they struck a very uh, lasting friendship here with Aquila and Priscilla. And actually, Paul would mention uh, Aquila and Priscilla in the book of Romans. Romans, uh, let me read it for you here. Romans 16. From verses 3. Say, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So he held them in high regard. These people risked their lives for the sake of Paul. Maybe, you know, hosting Paul, maybe just going around someone who, you know, the religious leaders are against. It was... Not an easy time, but yet he did that for them. So Paul really acknowledges that. And Paul went on to do what he normally does. In verses 4, the Bible says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Gentiles. This is what he does. He goes to a new town, a new city. He will go to the synagogue because there you will find the Jews, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. But in this context, there are things that are happening. Um, when Silas and Timothy had come to Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ, because this was a problem. They believed in the Messiah, they taught about the Messiah, but they never knew who he was. And when uh, Paul is expounding the scriptures and telling them that, hey, he's been here, he's lived among us, he died on the cross, he rose again, he's saving people. That was hard for, the, so for some people who practice Judaism. And when these friends showed up, um, you know, they, they had visited many churches, you know, the Thessalonians and Philippians and other places. But you know, when they came with the good report that they came from, or the, that they brought from Thessalonians, that encouraged Paul to continue making a case for Christ. He says in um, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, sorry, chapter 3, verse 6, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distresses, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. 
the faith, the, 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 the commitment to the Lord made Paul realize that whatever work he did there or this man were doing there, it's never in vain. And you know what we ought to do? To continue doing that. And so Paul was compelled by the Spirit to testify to the Jews that Jesus is, is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. And from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Why is it important that Paul would always go to the Jews first? And now he's gone to the Jewish people, they have rejected him, and they have blasphemed the Christ that he is uh, uh, preaching. He says, my hands are clean. You remember what was uh, told Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter three, verses 18, when God, you know, God appointed him as a watchman. God said to, to him, you know, I am, I am sending you to these people to warn them. And if you do not do that, all their blood will be upon your head. But if you do warn them, your hands are clean. Your hands are clean. And it will be upon them. This is exactly what Paul is doing right here. Say, my hands are clean. From now on, I will go to another group of people, the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was just next to the synagogue. That was, that was a good deal for Paul. <laughs> He loved the synagogue, so it's just right there. You know, he would probably hear what they talk about. And, you know, always he's, he, he would go to the marketplaces also to go and preach the gospel. But they have rejected. And he said, well, I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to go to some other people and preach the gospel. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians. And hearing, they believed and were baptized. So while others rejected Paul and blasphemed Christ, just as in many others believed and were baptized. You know, in our generation and many other generations, people will always say, oh, uh, uh, everyone is doing this, so I got to do it. Everyone is doing this, so I got to jump in and be like them. No, you don't got to be like people when they're indulging in sin, when they're doing things that are ungodly. You know, you, you cannot live in peaceful coexistence with sin and please God at the same time. It is not possible. If God has said this is sin, you ought to run away from it. Run away. You, we, we, you don't say, well, everyone is doing it. Or everyone has gone that direction. Or everyone is doing this. Remember, you are not everyone. And your personal assignment is different. Serve God in the area of your calling. If people join you, it's a plus. If they don't, God is with you. You're never alone. He said that I am with you. So we have a family and a other group of people who believed. And now the Lord spoke to Paul in a dream, in a vision by night. This is what the Lord said. Do not be afraid. Don't we love these words when someone says them to us? And especially the Lord saying, do not be afraid. 
a clear indication that even the men who serve God at some point will have refluxes and will be afraid. He doesn't say that to people who are not afraid. He says that to people who have moments of low, moments where they are afraid, they don't know what is gonna happen tomorrow. We don't know how the religious leaders and the governments are gonna do. I don't know what they're gonna do next. Are they gonna stay, you know, shut the church down? Are they gonna say, don't do this? Like, what? We, we are afraid sometimes. But what an assurance from the Lord himself saying, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Maybe he was drifting to that uh, moment where he's like, maybe, you know, these people, they have rejected me. They have blasphemed the Lord. What do I do with them? And the Lord is saying, keep doing what you do. You might not see the fruit today, but he says, keep doing it. Keep moving. Don't stop. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. <laughs> you know, I've, I've had people refer to Eldred City as a sin city. Why? Because we, we have a lot of clubs. You know, we have a lot of promiscuity going around this town. A lot of bad things happening. Like this is a sin city. This is, people are totally given to sexual immorality and other things. That is the exact thing that is happening in Corinth. But you know what God says? No one will hurt you. And I still got a lot of people in this city. <laughs> you know, sometimes you, you get to a point where you're thinking, maybe I'm the only one who believes in God. Maybe I'm the only one who prays to God. Maybe I'm the only one who reads the Bible. Maybe I'm the only one who fasts and prays. Maybe I'm the only one. You remember Elijah? He said, God, they have killed all the prophets. I alone am remaining. And Jezebel, the wicked one, seeks my life. In, in, you know, you know, politely he's telling God, if I'm done, we're done. <laughs> There's nobody else who's gonna preach the gospel. So for the good of the gospel, protect my life. <laughs> but God said, mm -mm, I got 7,000 more. What do you think about that? <laughs> if that will not humble you, then you're a very prideful guy. <laughs> Say, I have more people. I have a lot of people in this town that you don't know about. There's some old lady, old man somewhere there praying for us and we don't know. There's some people fasting and praying for the church. We don't know about them. They're here in Eldoret Town. You think you know them? No, the Lord knows. He says, I have a lot of people. Maybe you're the many people he's talking about when people are saying this town is rotten. God always have remnants. Every season, every time, God has a way of protecting his people and to making sure his word is preached. So don't be prideful and think, oh, maybe I'm the one. No, no, no. God has a lot of people. And that should cause you to be humble. The Lord gave this wonderful assurance to Paul. And I believe that many of us also, we have this, you know, in our reflexes of fear, God's people, are granted tremendous assurance that he is with us. So we should keep going and going. And after this assurance, Paul continued here 
uh, the Bible says, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God amongst them. He was rejuvenated. He was strengthened again and went back to preaching uh, God's word. And when Galia was proconsul or the governor of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Now just think about that. You know what God says? I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. And so even when they, you know, they're against Paul and they're taking him to the governor, he's not afraid because the Lord said what? I am with you and no one will hurt you. So whether you go through the fires, maybe the Lord has ordained it, but you're not going to be consumed by it. There's the fourth man who will appear in the fire. So they brought him before the judgment seat, saying, this fella persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was just about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes or Jews, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look it to yourself. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. <laughs> this guy, has, he has no time to play games. He has no time for things that really are going to waste his time. Like if it's a matter of you guys' law, you're permitted to worship, you guys go deal with these things in the, in the synagogues. This is, there's no crime here. If it's just jargons or where people are using names and words, you guys go figure that out. Off my presence. <laughs> what, what do you think of that guy? Like, I think he's cool. <laughs> For religious matters, you guys are supposed to deliberate by yourselves. Think about it by yourselves, you know. Uh, find judges amongst yourselves, but don't bring them to me. But these people, they got mad. Then the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue. So we had that one, uh, Crispus, who got born again. He became a Christian and uh, is with Paul. Probably his position was taken and was given to this uh, Sosthenes, who also became a Christian. But now they brought this Sosthenes, a ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galileo took no notice of these things. Before the seat, <laughs> he's seated there and they're doing whatever they're doing there and there you know, punches and blows, and he's not even flinching. It's like whatever they want to do. That, that, that is off my docket. I don't want to think about it. Whatever they're going to do, that is their own business. Galil, the governor, correctly, so that the, the government has no role in attempting to decide religious matters so every government should know that they don't have the right to meddle in our business as the church. Amen? We decide when to close the doors. Not the government telling us when to close the doors. They have no right whatsoever. So he realizes that though the government does have legitimate role in matters of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, they have the right to administer justice in that regard. And while Galileo took no notice of the Jews, God took notice of Paul and protected him as he had promised in verse 10. They did not beat Paul. He said, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. 
Friends, I would implore you to believe in the words of Christ when he speaks to you. If he says, I will be with you, believe it. Take it to the bank. Or, well, they can ban the bank. Just believe it. <laughs> Just believe it wholeheartedly that his word stands and it's true. I will put protect you, no one will hurt you. Those are lovely words to hear from your king, your Lord. Whatever happens in the world, I'll protect you. I will be with you, no one will hurt you. So keep on doing what you do. Keep on with your calling, with whatever you do, keep on doing it and the Lord will bless you. It's a blessing to, to be consistent in what God has called you to do. Whether in pain, or whether in life or death, we are still going to proclaim the goodness of God. And so we see also a very strange thing by Paul here. Um, he remains a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And he had his hair cut off at Syncria, for he had taken a vow. Like Paul, he's still practicing <laughs> the Jewish customs. And he remembers that is, you know, you. In your own time, you can uh, read Numbers chapter 6. The vow that Paul had taken seems like one of a Nazarite. Usually this vow was taken for a certain period of time. And when completed, the hair was cut and offered to the Lord at a special ceremony at the temple in Jerusalem. So there was a feast in Jerusalem and Paul is making all these plans. He shaved and you know what he's going to do with his hair? He's going to offer it before the Lord because that was commanded through the scriptures. And you see the, the preacher warns us in uh, Ecclesiastes, he says, do not be hasty when you go to the house of the Lord making vows that you ain't gonna fulfill. For if you don't fulfill them, they, come, they become as near to you. They become a sin. And you know what sin becomes or brings forth? is death. Be careful when you're making vows. And when you make a vow before the Lord, fulfill it by doing exactly what you said. For whatever reason, uh, that Luke is not telling us Paul had vowed to the Lord for something and he says he's not going to cut his hair for some period of time. And when he did cut his hair, he rushed to Jerusalem to do that. But he took leave from them saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you God willing. You see what Paul is doing also. Is Paul never took chances to have confidence in himself, but rather trusted in the will of God. He said, I will come back to you, God willing. If you see me, you know that that is the will of God. If you don't, it is the will of God also for me to remain there or to go to another place. But friends, don't, don't trust so much in your ability. Don't even trust in your ability. Trust God. And he will lead you right. He knows about tomorrow. He knows about your life, every aspect of it. So you better trust in him. James also echoes this word and say, you know, don't just say, you know, well, tomorrow I'll go and do this and do this. Say, if God wills, I will go and transact this business. I will go and visit this town. I'll go and do this and that. 
within the will of God. So friends, be careful. Don't just say things for the sake of it. I want us to conclude by looking at the life of this last man that is mentioned here, Apollos, as the worship team comes. The Bible says, now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John, that is of repentance. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogues. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciple to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing that showing through the scripture that Jesus is Christ. What a wonderful man. What a wonderful uh, testimony from this guy who was, you know, in Egypt, in Alexandria, a very far region as compared to where Paul is, but he was instructed in the ways of the Lord. He had the knowledge of the uh, baptism of John, uh, John taught about repentance and all that stuff. He was well versed, but the the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he was probably not well versed in those. And because we have a couple who served, we would call them missionaries, Aquila and Priscilla. They had a good grasp of the grace of God, and so after he spoke to the people, you know what they did? They brought him aside. Not to embarrass him for the things he didn't know, but to cause him to know more so that he'll be more effective in sharing the gospel. Because sometimes we'll see people, you know, they say words that they shouldn't have said, like, that was dumb. <laughs> that was creepy. Why, why did he say that? The Lord can never use you. The Lord can never do one, 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 one. And, you know, uh, people will condemn and do all those many things and you're just broken. You don't even want to serve anymore. Why? Because that very moment when you didn't know, they didn't instruct you better. But we thank God for people like Aquila and Priscilla who said, this man has been called by God. We gotta help him anyways. So they called him, you know, for a cup of coffee, for Java or KFC, whatever. And they instructed him better. The Bible says, and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. More accurately. And then, you know, the story of Apollos shows us the, the great need of discipleship. People ought to be discipled. You know, those who have grown in the Lord. You don't see people having the desire to serve the Lord and you're just leaving them there. You ought to help them, right? Grow people, grow together in the Lord. And we also see the willingness to learn. Be willing to learn. You're not too old not to listen, not too young not to be instructed in the ways of the Lord. Every one of us, we know for sure that we need the Lord. There are things 
that my mind has not yet grasped. I would wish that those that have gone ahead would teach me because I want to learn. I want to know the Lord more so that I will be effective in sharing the gospel more and more. There are things you'll hear from people that might need your further instruction, whether it's at home, at a restaurant, somewhere. We gotta do the way Aquila and Priscilla did to Apollos. And one great thing that we see here, that he did not resist. He was willing to learn. He was not a proud man who would say, well, who are you guys? Uh, Do you know my school? Do you know where I come from? Do you know my background? He didn't bring all of that. He received it and he became more effective. The Bible says, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scripture that Jesus is the Christ. Vigorously. This was, this was a man who was very consistent. A man who uh, desired to do nothing else but to make Christ known to people. Not his own opinion, but all that was in the scriptures. For my opinions will fail me too soon. But the word of God remains. Friends, remember what the Lord told Paul. Do not fear. I am with you. Maybe you have a situation that has gripped you with a lot of fear. You have gone through things that have left your heart empty. But that emptiness is a place where you you should meet your Savior. Every one of us, there's a void inside of us that always cries for the God who is a Savior. Those who need to be saved. There's a savior present today. He says that I will not let them lay their hands upon you. I'll put a hedge of protection around you. I'll be with you. And also, I'm going to bring you before people who also encourage you the people who will walk with you, the people who will not diss you for the wrongs you have done and just say, you know, this this man, this woman is done deal. The Lord can never use them. Or maybe it's the enemy who has been whispering these things in your head, telling you that, you know, remember the things you have done. Remember how you have sinned against God. You've done these things. The Lord can never use a person like you. the enemy ever said one truth? Never. Whatever he says, don't believe him. It's a lie. In fact, he laughs at you when you believe his word because he knows it's not true. But God remains to be true and trustworthy. I don't know what kind of fear you have as we bow our heads in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. The Lord knows your heart. The Lord knows everything that concerns you. Take it to Him. God, we thank you. We bless you for what you have done. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Thank you that you have forgiven us. Thank you that you have led us.
into your ways that are everlasting. As many as we are gathered today in your presence with different needs, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come to us, encourage those who need encouragement, strengthen those who need strengthening, and save those who need saving. We bless you, God. And as we give to you, as we continue in worship and give our offerings, our finances to you, we pray that would give a percentage that is glorifying to you. In your name we pray. Amen.